I'm going to start just by introducing yourself and then move from there. Is that all right? Yeah, of course. Awesome. So, yeah. Hey, folks. Mark Taranzoni here. I'm one of the leaders within what we call external security services within AWS. Our chart is quite simple. We build products and services that our customers can use to help fulfill their side of the shared security responsibility model. And so if you give examples of the kind of services you normally work with, Mark? Yeah, so within our suite of services, we've got threat detection with guard duty, we've got posture management with security hub, we've got vulnerability management with inspector, we have data classification with Macy, and then on the response side, we have Amazon detective for investigations, threat hunting, and triage, and then most recently, we launched what's called Security Lake, which is our repository for customers to put all of their security telemetry uh, to power some use cases on top. And maybe a good place to start because uh, our audience is quite wide in terms of we have anyone who's a cloud security engineer today versus all the way up to a CISO or a VP or director of cloud security as well. In terms of how you've seen these, why was there a need for this specifically, these services, as you call, called out specific categories as well, data classification, yes. threat detection, posture management. So uh, what was like the, the starting point for all these? At AWS, security is always job zero. We've been recognized and known for securing of the cloud. But uh, as customers build applications, it's, it's really no different when, with than what they would have done on-prem. Yep. They build some infrastructure, they build some applications, they have some customer or important information, and they need to secure it and protect it. The difference is the infrastructure is quite different in the cloud than it is from a non-profit environment. Yep. So the sp specialized tooling that we deliver is based on our knowledge over doing this a number of years, of what the potential threat factors are and what the misconfigurations that can lead to threats are within the environment. Naturally, we wanted to give tools to help customers in their security journey be able to fulfill their requirements easily and seamlessly. And do you find that the adoption has, I don't know how the adoption has worked in this each one of these categories, because I think they came at different times as well. So we've been talking about Amazon for about 12 plus years now. Over time, it's added on to the repertoire of, oh, these are new services that are being available. In terms of adoption of these native services from Amazon, how has that adoption started and where do you see a large or maybe not enough adoption? Yeah, it's a great question. They are all in different phases, right? Guard duty is probably the service that's been out the longest. Yeah. So by default, it's got the largest yeah. set of adoption. And, and it's almost the two services I would say that are on by default for a lot of customers are guard duty and security hub. And they're the foundational aspects, right? You come in and you need to determine if you're getting any threats within your environment, which is what Guard Duty does in near real time. And what um, Security Hub CSPM or Posture Management does is it goes off and just checks all your environment configurations and tells you where there's something that's configured in a way that you may not want it. Now, in many cases, some sometimes customers do want it configured that way and they have the ability to suppress those findings. But yeah, yeah we at least do that initial analysis <clears throat> Then layered on top, you have our vulnerability management solution with Inspector, which is, covers Lambda, EC2 instances, the software stack that's associated on those instances for customers, and scans against the known database of known vulnerabilities and flags them. Yep. But then when you have all those base services on, inevitably, as things start to fire in the form of findings, your customers need to go dive deeper and understand what's really going on here and how are these disparate findings connected and is there a pattern that's going on that maybe suggests there's something malicious happening in my environment? And that's where Detectives Machine Learning comes in and kind of pieces that all together and provides the ability to deep dive into Security Lake, into the raw records, and, and close the case out. So they were built in a way to complement each other and yep. give customers a lot of capabilities out of the box. By no means do we lock out any of our partners. They're a vibrant partner ecosystem that com is combined with the services that we deliver as well. But because your question is really around adoption, I would say that those foundational ones are very highly adopted throughout our customer bases. Yeah. And then the value-added add-ons are getting increasingly more deployed. And would you say, is there like a spread of small to medium-sized businesses or enterprise? Because we, I think just before we got onto the recording, we were talking about the whole public sector and compliance requirements over there as yeah. well. Do you find that, is there a lot more demand for this in terms of the public sector? Because I guess some of the challenges of the public sector is the fact that is the service itself is compliant or not as well. And we spoke about some of the compliance requirements over there. So what's the responsibility on the customer side for a lot of this, yeah. where different sectors are involved? Yeah, so 
first, our customer base, it's, it's across the spectrum. We yep. have small to medium sized customers up to the largest uh, enterprises and government agencies across the board. So there is a wide spectrum. There are certainly some verticals that are much more security aware and in conscious than others. Yeah. Um, but I think the awareness is starting to permeate throughout the whole segment. I would say that as you go higher up into the enterprise customers, we're largely drilling directly with those teams because okay. they have security teams and those teams are utilizing our products and operationalizing them. Yep, yep. As you sometimes get into the small, medium size, it may be an MSSP turning on our services on behalf of the customer and right. managing the, the process and the program for the customer. So we see a combination of those. And would you say, in terms of, because I guess a lot of people would also be thinking about 2024 is coming in and they want to build a cloud security program. What does that look like? And maybe we can cover from, hey, anyone who's probably never done cloud security program, CISO, what walks in, or anything about technical, like a CISO cloud security roadmap. What is our starting point for them? Yeah, it's a great question. If you don't have any idea on what you want to accomplish or what your regulatory requirements are today and what they may be in the future, I would immediately suggest you talk to one of our team members and maybe in some cases we bring partners in play to help customers really identify early on what their security program should be yep. and to help implement it. What we find is if we're able to do that on the front end, it actually makes the customers go faster in mm. the back end, right? And I've seen in a number of cases where customers migrate into the cloud, they don't build security into that initial phase of migration because they're somewhat still testing the waters. Yep. And then they find that, wow, this is really uh, you know, enabling my teams to move f much faster, but now I gotta figure out security. And then now they go back and rework it. And I would suggest, uh, you know, if you know what you wanna do, start, with the preventative side. Yeah. Like if we can prevent things from ever happening because we've put controls into our environment up front based on our requirements around security, yep. then that's going to solve a lot of problems. It doesn't mean you don't need to monitor in the back end, but I, I think you'll find you'll get far less things identified into your environment if you block things out and protect in the front end. And as you go to that next stage of maturity, I guess now we've spoken to someone who's a TAM, have worked through that process of at least the initial foundational pieces. Where do you see the next maturity comes in? Yeah, then it becomes in the fact of, okay, I've got all the tools in place and I've got all the monitoring in place. Yeah. How do I operationalize it in my company? So in some cases, it's a DevSecOps person in a sp small company that's managing both the applications and the security of them. In other cases, it's large security teams that are very specifically focused on securing the applications within the cloud. But where I get into operationalization is that the security folks find something that needs to get sorted but they're not usually the ones that sort it. Now it's gonna go back into the dev development pipeline for a developer to make a change, whether it's patching some code that has a vulnerability or you're removing some hard-coded capabilities around credentials that were identified throughout the process. But inevitably, there's a developer that needs to get do, do something. Where I see the maturity level is when companies have built that program internally to say, okay, here's my expertise around when something happens, to here's my process to rapidly remediate it by creating those linkages internally. Yeah. And those, those are the companies that I see moving very fast in this space. Oh, and what about like examples of, I don't know if you have any customer examples where they're like almost as in AWS some level 500 or level 600. Like what, what are those people like? What are they doing, which may be aspirational for some people to put in their cloud security program? Yeah, in many cases, they are, they're utilizing a lot of the tools and capabilities that we have combining them with uh, third-party mm. capabilities. Mm. And and what I see happening, it's been an interesting ride. I've been at uh, AWS for five years. I would say that in the first couple of years, companies would run, in some cases, multiple tools that l largely did the same thing. Okay. And I've seen over the last couple of years, many companies look to consolidate tools. Yep. and. I think the ones that are uh, at the very forefront have really honed in on the specific value of the tools in their tool, toolbox yeah. and have integrated them in a way that gives them a uh, significant uh, coverage and advantage. Now, these, these companies have resources and large security teams to be able to do that. Yeah, but yeah. the one trend that I am seeing across the board is 
companies want integrated solutions. They don't want APIs that they have to piece together to form their security plan. Yeah, That's I, coming I, out loud and clear. I definitely would love to get into the trend part as well. In terms of people who are using this and are like at that level, do we get to talk about the teams as well? One question that people normally ask is also, this is my team size when I was a medium to start up, kind of three people outside the CISO or head of security. And that kind of grows. A lot of times there's a lot of confusion around what responsibility do I need to have in my team? Or AWS obviously has their own model and stuff. Do you find that in terms of teams, do you get to see some of that as well in some of these companies? Yeah, a little bit. We certainly get to meet with a lot of CISOs across the spectrum, I do. Mm -hmm. And in those conversations, I do ask a, a little bit of how, how they're organized because it, I've seen that evolve as, as well too. And I think companies, as they move to the cloud, went one or two ways, right? One, one way is they just build a cloud center of excellence and that, you know, it's separate from their corporate security and yep. their on-prem and, and everything else associated with it. Uh, another way is they try to keep it all together and they bring in some expertise on the cloud side, but contain them from a process standpoint within their overall security structure. There's no right or wrong, in of my course. opinion. Yeah. Uh, these are the approaches I've seen companies take because there is a difference, right? There's on-prem, there's not as many API. There's certain things that are unique and different and in the cloud. Yeah, definitely a learning curve as well. Uh, so talking about the trend part as well, I think that's like my last question as well. Where, where do you see the trend for cloud security go at the moment? You said a lot of people consolidating it. Is there any other trend that you're noticing? And because I think there were a few announcements here as well, I guess just before. Would you want to share that as well? Sure. I'll talk about announcements we made and, and then I'll and then I'll walk into where I see in trends. Yeah. On our threat detection side, guard duty, we announced expansion of our runtime capabilities from EKS to EC2, ECS, and Fargate. Oh. So that was a pretty big and new announcement. So oh. we have runtime detection capabilities really across the spectrum of where customers run their compute. Oh, across the compute. That, yeah. And that's almost like doing endpoint protection as well. Yeah, it's agent-based on a runtime capability. So that was exciting and, and new news. We yeah, were already wow. in EKS, and now it's been expanded. Pretty aw side. awesome. So, yeah, that was a big deal. Yeah. On the inspector side, we announced a generative AI capability in partnership with Code Guru, where mm. when we identify vulnerabilities across Lambda code functions, we can now actually come back to the customer with a remediated fix. Mm. And again, reducing that cycle time from identification of a vulnerability to fixing it before it gets exploited in the wild. So oh, and um, oh, I, can, I, I can already see the use case for it as well, because Inspector is quite widely used for vulnerability management, adding code grew onto it as well. And the spectrum of compute covered. Oh, what are the two main uh, announcements that you had from the so far? I'm sure Werner would have his own share after he comes. But yeah, we've got, we actually got to have a couple yeah. more. Um, uh, Security Hub announced global configuration, which was super important because yeah. they have so many checks for CSPM across all the the workloads customers run. Yeah. In every region that they run them, and yeah. customers were really interested in centralizing that, and we added some more dashboarding capabilities to Security Hub too as well. Also, you can customize data dashboards on. Yeah. Oh, that would be a game changer. A lot of people go for a third party also because they realize. Oh, I can't customize it enough. And so now there is that capability as well. Yeah. And then lastly, with Detective, we had four major announcements. One was deep integration with Security Lake, so we can actually pull back the raw records and customers can click onto our visualizations and immediately spawn a query down into Security Lake and bring back uh, raw data and raw records. The second one is around automated investigations, where we built some machine learning capabilities around investigating IAM principles. And customers can actually just, with a single click, when they get to an identified user or role that is of interest, they can go off and run this ML and bring back a lot of artifacts to determine if there's something suspicious and malicious going on. And the other two is now we support the new findings the guard duty produces with the runtime monitoring. But the last one is an LLM-based capability in Detective. Under the covers, Detective takes all the findings that we have visibility to, runs uh, graph algorithms in machine learning, and clusters them together. Mm. So it takes the noise of millions of findings down to, in some cases, five, ten, hundred clusters, depending on the customer size, but magnitude shrinking from the findings. When the get, customer gets these clusters, it, sometimes it's multiple findings, sometimes multiple resources, and they've said, hey, this is really great because it's a prioritization that I didn't have before but can you explain this to me? What's going on? How did it start and how did it traverse and how did it get to where it is now? 
So we integrated with um, LLM to provide the human readable explanation of what these finding groups are, are seeing in their environment. Wow. So we're excited about that. So a lot going on. Um, it lead, leads into some of the trends, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think consolidation is a big thing, right? In our six services, we're trying to shrink that service down a little bit. We're moving all of our vulnerability things closer together. Security Hub, CSBM is largely infrastructure vulnerabilities. Yep. Inspectors, software and code vulnerabilities. You'll see those two come together very closely. In the threat detection side, we've already unified that under guard duty. Over the years, you've seen expand from accounts in network activity, to S3 data activity, to RDS activity, to now runtime activity. So we continue to expand the capabilities, but under the Guard Duty brand. And then on the response side, Security Hub, the findings aggregation, Detective, and uh, Security Lake work together and combine into a, a path where customers can start on Security Hub. If that's the level of maturity they have, then yeah. they want to go in to do some you know, investigations. They can turn on seamlessly Detective and they want to go in and start bringing in all their raw telemetry from their other states and other clouds, they can immediately bring in Security Lake and have that be the center of gravity of all their security data. I think we've mentioned Security Lake quite often just in this conversation as well. I think it's worthwhile explaining to people what Security Lake is and what do you see people use that as? Because I think I understand the value of it. It'll be interesting for people to understand what is it and what's the value that people are finding from that service as well. Yeah, it, it's a fairly new service for us, but it really spawned from, like anything we do, customers' needs. And customers told us that they had trouble getting the hands around all the telemetry that was associated with not only the cloud workloads, but their on-prem and other cloud workloads in a single place that they mm. can make use of it when they need to. And then, you know, we started looking around to say, who's doing something in this area? Because it, it boils down to, for me, the outcomes customers want are largely driven by the analytics that run on top of these data sources. But in order to get to those analytics, multiple vendors have to do multiple things across the same data sources for customers that's inefficient and costly. So we had the idea of, let's go build a very simple place for customers to bring all their security to data together in their S3 bucket, not in a service S3 bucket, so customer has control of the data in an efficient format that allows for you to query and run analytics on top of it, where the customer can actually decide who has access to the data based on the tools that they want to work with. And when we started testing it with customers, virtually every customer, large and small, said, yes, please. This is a challenge for us. We're security engineers, we're not data wranglers, and we're spending half of our cycles wrangling data to get to the base level outcomes we're looking for. Now, it created a little bit of a challenge for us because the value becomes when you can normalize disparate data sources around a, a specific schema. Two years before launching Security Lake, we actually started working with industry to, to develop an open schema framework, and it's actually got GA'd at Black Hat earlier this year, but it's Open Cybersecurity Schema Framework, or OCSF. Yep. And we have started with two organizations two years ago. We opened the aperture up to about 15. We currently have 166 organizations contributing with 500 plus members, all open. We're bringing in the domain expertise of categories of companies, and these, in many cases, are competitors. Mm -hmm. But they're sitting down to the, at the table together to figure out what the right schema is for their segment of business, whether it's firewalls or endpoints yep. or posture management or findings producers. So we have this large community that's contributed to this open scheme or framework that is the, now going to be the language for security. And there's been schemas around for a long time, but yep. they've largely been driven by a single vendor yep. for the benefit of that vendor's product. This is really truly an open standard and it's the foundation around the data that we put in Security Lake and we have 60 partners writing data into Security Lake in that wow. format. And okay. another 20 or so partners building solutions on top for customers. Wow. I, I can already see that small to medium-sized businesses or people who use MSSPs can definitely benefit from this as well. Because I think to what you said, not everyone could have a SIEM provider as well. Correct. This kind of solves that problem. Instead of going for, hey, what's the most expensive or even more affordable ones are expensive, to be honest. I think that would definitely solve that problem. But thank you so much for sharing that. This is very even valuable. People probably want to know more about any of these services or maybe connect with you. What's the, what's the easiest way to connect with you on social media? I'm not very much on social media mm -hmm. these days, but uh, I think uh, people can find me on LinkedIn pretty easy. Awesome. All right. So. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for coming All on the right. show. 
Thank you. Thank you for this, everyone. I will see you next episode. Peace.